Good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are watching us from. I'm Vivian Salama, a national security correspondent for the Wall Street Journal, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar with the Alliance of Democracies Foundation in collaboration with the Coalition for the World uh, uh, for the World Security Community of Democracies on how to unite the world's democratic forces. Uh, it's part of the foundation's ongoing webinars of Defend Democracy, hashtag Defend Democracy, still catching up on all the those lingos. Um, cha I chaired the earlier discussion on building an alliance of democracies back in February, and I'm really delighted to be back with all of you today. Uh, since we last checked in the United Kingdom's chairmanship of the group of seven has included democratic alliances such as Australia, India, South Africa, South Korea. The same countries are also expected to gather their leaders later this week, hosted by UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson, um, where they're expected to, uh, to have an open society's charter. Uh, the open question is whether this meeting could lead to a formation of uh, democracies 10 or 11, D10 or D11, a strengthening cooperation among the world's major democracies. Uh, additionally, President Biden, has promised a summit of democracy, which could galvanize the free world. President Biden is actually uh, getting on an airplane probably in the next hour to head over to the UK to take part in the summit. So uh, we'll be looking at that from my end of uh, my side of the pond. Uh, and the Alliance of Democracies Foundation has also concluded their annual Copenhagen Democracy Summit on May 10th. It brought together leaders from around the world uh, and democracy activists to discuss the democracy community, how the democracy community can take collective action, which is obviously a very important issue these days, especially. And today we're going to discuss concretely how we can make that happen. Uh, how to unite the world's democratic forces is the topic we're talking about today. So I have some excellent speakers, none of whom need an introduction, but I will do so just for good measure. Uh, of course, our host, most of all, Anders Fogras Musen, chairman of the Alliance of Democracies Foundation. And of course, his other titles include former NATO Secretary General and Prime Minister of Denmark. Sir, always good to be with you. Uh, also, Lord Mark Sedwell, a G7 envoy for economic resilience and former cabinet secretary and national security advisor to uh, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Sir, it's great to see you on a busy week, especially. Uh, from the U.S., we have Ash Jane, Senior Fellow of the Atlantic Council, joining us. Ash has been a mastermind behind the new Atlantic Council report on D10 cooperation, which I'm sure you'll hear about from him. And I also have some uh, clips that I'm going to share with you as well. And finally, last but not least, uh, we'll hear from Didier Jacobs, Vice President of the Coalition for the World Security Community Democratic of uh, Democratic Nations, who will also give us an overview on the uh, initiative aimed at transformation of NATO and the OECD into a true community of democracies. And so lots of hot topics we're touching on today. Uh, let me mention that you can also uh, send your questions to us uh, uh, and we're encouraged to do so. We have a Zoom room with a Q&A section. And so you can send your questions there. You can also watch us on Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn uh, and you leave your comments in the field and use the hashtag defend democracy. And so please, everyone, hopefully we're at the, the light is at the end of this tunnel coming up in terms of our uh, virtual uh, gatherings. But for now, we want to make it as interactive as possible. So we want to hear from you for sure. So we have about 60 minutes total. I'm sure that uh, everyone is eager to hear our speakers. And so I'm going to kick off the discussion with a question for each panelist. And then hopefully we can all just sort of discuss together uh, and see how much we can get. And then about 15 minutes before we end, we're also going to leave some time for questions from all of you as well. And so I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Uh, just a few last points. The Copenhagen Democracy Summit and the foundation also launched a yearly democracy perception index uh, where they hold uh, citizens from two initiatives to gather an alliance of democracies, the UK's so-called uh, so called D10 and the Biden uh, Summit for Democracy. And about half of the world's population support both the D10 and President Biden's Summit for Democracy. So about 51% support the UK D10, about 55% support Biden's summit. Uh, and a bonus, support among the D10 countries was the highest in India, in interestingly, 67% percent support for UK D10, 70% for President Biden's summit. So with that, 
Um, I'm going to start uh, turning things over to our speakers today. And Anders, we're going to start with you, sir, of course. Um, you have been advocating for a while for the so-called Alliance of Democracies. It's the name of your foundation, after all. Uh, and it, it, at, the at, at the 2021 Copenhagen Democracy Summit, the Copenhagen Charter for an Alliance of Democracies was launched. What are the most urgent areas, in your view, um, particularly with regard to democracy that need to be tackled? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Vivian, for once again uh, joining us and uh, chairing uh, this uh, important discussion. You're right, uh, at uh, the recent Copenhagen Democracy Summit, we launched uh, a charter for an alliance of uh, democracies. The charter consists uh, of uh, three concrete proposals. Firstly, an economic Article 5, secondly, a tech alliance of democracies, and third, more support for democracy champions. First, um, the economic Article 5 is actually inspired by uh, NATO's Article 5, which says an attack on one ally is an attack on all. But increasingly, our freedom is not just undermined uh, by tanks, but by strategic investment and economic coercion. Examples abound from China uh, shutting out Australian wine producers and Taiwanese pineapples, or uh, Russian gas lines with political strings attached. Autocrats are effective at weaponizing the free world's uh, strength. So they have used our free markets to create a system of economic dependency where governments or businesses stay silent about human rights abuses, for example, uh, through fear of it costing them business. The economic article five would build tools to support those governments or businesses that come under such pressure. So in the case of Australian wine producers, for example, that wouldn't uh, just mean we all go out and buy a few extra bottles uh, from the Barossa Valley, but we also have credit facilities that could help those industries resist coercive actions and adjust their export or supply models. The retaliatory and unfounded sanctions by China on my foundation and on many elected representatives in the UK and the rest of Europe show the urgency of the democratic world's response. That's the first element. Secondly, we should make tech work for democracy, including standard setting for emerging tech. Technology has the power to facilitate both democracy and autocratic oppressors. Digital authoritarianism must be countered by a free world model of tech development. On artificial intelligence, I agree with President Putin for once. Uh, he said that whoever masters artificial intelligence will also lead globally. In my view, we should secure that is the free and democratic world. Election interference and uh, disinformation through our open social media is another challenge. Uh, with the Transatlantic Commission on Election Integrity, which I co-founded with uh, President Biden in 2018, we have worked to curb uh, election interference. I know that remains a priority for the president. In April, we saw it in the sanctions the US administration slapped uh, on uh, Russia. Among democratic countries, we can have a disagreement on how to regulate tech inside our democracies, 
but we need to see the bigger picture. Ultimately, when it comes to tech, the free world needs a simple approach. You not we win, divided, we fail. Now, thirdly, the charter demands uh, that we stand up for democracy's champions abroad and at home. Demands for more democracy are visible on the streets around the world, especially among young people. And we must support them in words and deeds, penalize those who oppress them, and fight corruption which decays democracies. We, who have the privilege to live in the free world, have a responsibility to help them. We do that in practice, uh, and uh, at the recent Copenhagen Democracy Summit, we heard testimonies from Nathan Law from Hong Kong, YY Nu from Myanmar, interim president Guaido from Venezuela, and uh, Svetlana uh, Tinat Nukaya from Belarus, where the state hijacking of a plane and kidnapping of a young dissident blogger shows a new authoritarian brazenness. We need firm responses to such actions. In the first instance, the charter was co-signed by Dan Twining from International Republican Institute and Derek Mitchell uh, from National Democratic Institute and myself. But at the summit and since, many more have added their signatures. So if it resonates with you, do sign up on our webpage. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anders. Lord said, well, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, you know, Anders says, united, we succeed, divided, we fail. And the G7 is basically trying to do that, unite major dem democratic nations with countries like Australia, India, South Africa, and uh, South Korea um, for the upcoming summit. But it's not all roses. I mean, anecdotally, there was a uh, amusing article uh, in the UK press this week about how uh, Downing Street confirmed that pr uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson doesn't like the term special relationship to describe the US-UK relationship. And so it's, it's, it's a quirky little thing, but actually in reality, there are a lot of obstacles to making this happen. And so what are the urgent priorities that you're hoping to see addressed in the coming days when these leaders meet? Well, first, um, uh, thank you very much, Vivian, and thank you to you uh, for convening this and uh, to chairing this and to Anders for inviting me to join you again. Always a great privilege to be on a platform uh, with him. And let me just um, echo a couple of the points he made, and then I'll come to the, the point um, you made. Um, we are, we've proposed, the panel I chaired has proposed something we're calling the Cornwall Consensus to be adopted by leaders at the G7. It's up on the G7 website for those who want to have a look at it. And it actually echoes all of those points that Anders Fogh Rasmussen just made, including the, the economic Article 5. The language is slightly different, uh, but it echoes all of those points. And that's because um, it is really important that the, uh, the, the uh, democratic world, and in particular the G7, which is, of course, a group of advanced economies as well as uh, advanced democracies, um, is, uh, uh, is united around these issues. And the first point in that consensus is solidarity, solidarity among the G7. So remembering uh, that you, we need to be uh, more united among ourselves. We've seen in the past uh, G7 countries using, for example, national security legislation in trade, investment, et cetera, against each other, forgetting that we're allies and do not present a national security threat to each other. Um, we haven't always responded as effectively as we should have done in that economic Article 5 way that uh, Anders Fogh Rasmussen was just talking about uh, when countries have faced pressure from autocratic uh, regimes. And we probably haven't caucused as effectively as we should in those wider multilateral fora to set the tech standards that serve um, democratic uh, values. And so we're arguing that uh, in this Cornwall consensus uh, that uh, the G7 leaders should uh, take exactly that approach but see themselves as the, new, as the nucleus of a wider community of nations um, uh, who should associate themselves with the same concept. And that's going to require the G7 to 
exercise that uh, essentially collaborative leadership that it, I think it does when it does uh, when it does it best. Um, uh, what what really matters, I think, out of G7 summits and summits of this kind, is um, not just the sense of common purpose. And I, you know, I'm, I'm confident we will see that restored at this summit after a period when the G7 relationship was frankly quite fractious, let's be honest. I think we will see that restored. There's clearly an impetus to do so. And I don't think people should worry about phrases like, do we use the special relationship and so on? I think actually the point Boris Johnson was making was that actually we shouldn't hang on to uh, particular phrases as though you know, the, the phrase itself is what matters. What matters is the underlying strength of the relationship, not a particular way of uh, a way of describing uh, of describing it. And what this G7 summit will do, I hope, is demonstrate on the really substantive issues that face the world that the G7 is prepared to uh, play a leadership role. So on climate change, you'll know that there are several very big ideas out there uh, for the G7 to adopt in the run-up to the COP. Uh, 26 summit uh, later this year. Uh, we will see the same, I hope, on economic resilience. And the fact, as you mentioned right at the beginning of the video, that we have um, four other nations attending. Two, like the G7, um, you know, very similar economies to the G7, South Korea and Australia, two um, uh, a bigger um, uh, 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 and a big developing uh, economies, India and, uh, uh, and South Africa means that hopefully the, you know, this, this summit will create that sense of, uh, that sense of common purpose um, looking ahead um, and recognize that democratic values are not just um, concentrated in um, advanced economies. The democratic values spread into developing economies as well. And actually in the future, the most successful developing economies in my view will be those that, um, uh, uh, that also advanced democratic values, whether that's India and South Africa who are here, Brazil, Indonesia, Malaysia, one can think of many, many countries that have robust democracies um, and are also uh, proving to be very uh, successful, growing uh, and fast developing economies, the way that South Korea, for example, did um, in the few decades after the end of the Korean War when it became a successful economy and then a successful democracy. Um, and that kind of pattern is one um, I hope uh, that the G7 will encourage. Thanks for that. Ash, uh, you just put out um, a very interesting report. Um, and one, si one little clip that I want to read really kind of underscores something that unites so many of these members beyond the G7, but even this uh, proposed G10. Uh, D10. Uh, China is growing more powerful and Russia is more assertive and challenging key tenants of the global system, each in their own ways, but increasingly aligned as they engage in coercive tactics to expand their influence. Meanwhile, democracies are on the defensive as they seek to contend with these global threats, even as many, including the United States, face deeply polarized electorates and growing political dysfunction at home. And so to start us off, can you tell us what unites so many of these countries that we're talking about? Is it that they all face a common threat primarily, or are there other areas where they can work together as well, you know, sort of toward the positive beyond just adversarial challenges facing the world as a whole? Well, thanks, Vivian. Thanks for the question. Uh, it's a want to say first, it's a pleasure to be here on this panel, uh, and especially to join uh, Prime Minister Rasmussen, who's been a, a passionate and leading voice for strengthening democratic cooperation for years. Um, we've also been advocating for stronger cooperation among democracies, and so this is a very timely and important event. Um, and as you mentioned, we re released a report yesterday that focuses on one option for how to strengthen cooperation among leading democracies. Uh, and to cooperate more uh, closely on global challenges. Um, the question you raise is a good one, and, and it's one that we, we address in the report, uh, and essentially it gets at what is it about the shared and common values and interests that binds a group like this together. And I think that starts from sort of the environment, the context that we're operating in, in today. Um, the world is, is entering a, a new era of strategic competition, um, and, and as, as uh, we've been Noting in the report, China and Russia, as you mentioned, are disrupting the rules-based system. Uh, President Biden called this a moment of an inflection point between autocracy and democracy. And the question really is with the challenges that democracies are facing to their way of looking at the world, their orientation around a rules-based system, how do we organize to defend that system? 
and, and how, how do we ensure that the values that underpin that system, the norms and rules that were developed over the years continue to be those that govern uh, that order? Well, one option is to form a, 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 a kind of new coalition around the G7, but in an expanded form. Uh, as, uh, as Lord Sedwell was saying, uh, that this year's summit includes several new participants uh, which have been invited as guests. And the question is, is there enough of a degree of like-mindedness among this group where you can actually come up with some solutions to the kinds of challenges and, and issues uh, that, that we need to address today? Um, that could be in the area of technology, uh, as Prime Minister Rasmussen was emphasizing. Uh, it could be in the area of dealing with nuclear proliferation. Uh, Iran and North Korea continue to be very important challengers to the system. Uh, it could be around economic engagement, um, not just kind of defending against economic coercion, but also coming up with a new way of advancing free and fair trade in ways that benefit uh, citizens in democracies. Um, and, and it includes countering authoritarianism and dealing with climate. But perhaps the, the most compelling reason and what binds this kind of group together is the fact that we need a better strategy coordinated to deal with the, the China and Russia challenge. Uh, that's where democracies have a particular interest. This group, the G7, uh, or what may become a D10, can play a, a particularly important role because there is no other venue that brings together leading uh, powers in, in Europe and in the Asia Pacific uh, to, be, to be focused on, on common challenges. Um, I think the biggest question though is this is how to ensure like-mindedness that there's a sort of cohesion, cohesion <laughs> behind the group. And we've identified a couple of factors that we think would be important if we're going to permanently create a structure or a coalition of democracies. Uh, one is, is there a kind of shared sense of strategic purpose? Do the countries in this group have a shared understanding of the nature of the threats we're facing? And, and do they uh, have a common commitment to democracy and democratic values uh, at home? Th that's really critical for, I think, the underpinnings of the group. And then the second is, do they have the capacity to influence, uh, provide sort of global influence and, and shape the international system in responding to these challenges? And that means you need to have countries at the table that have significant economic, diplomatic, and military influence. Uh, at the same time, we need to keep the group as small as possible. Uh, as, as someone noted, uh, it's the smallest number needed to have the largest possible impact. And based on this criteria, I, I think it's pretty clear that the G7 itself is the right set of membership uh, to start with, uh, core, core democracies, powerful and, and economically engaged. Uh, Australia and South Korea also uh, seem to fit the bill. They're, they're committed to this, uh, upholding the rules-based system. India is probably next on the list. Um, it's a rising democracy that has a lot of common interests and, and, and shared values, but it's still a question mark, I think, as to whether and, and to what extent it's prepared to uh, really stand together and take some difficult steps in its own orientation to the world. I'm talking specifically about its relationship with Russia. Um, uh, and so that's a question mark. South Africa and Brazil probably could be considered for participation in a group like this. But again, both of those countries are still deciding where they want to position themselves in this kind of competition in the global order. So there's a lot of questions open that we need to address um, and, and we can talk more about how to address some of those concerns. But, but I, I think there is a practical way to create a coalition and, and deal with some of these issues, especially in the context of the, of the challenges we, we face from autocratic powers today. Thanks for that, Ash. I'm sure we're gonna be elaborating a lot more on that, uh, on that overview that you just gave. Uh, and Didier, your coalition for a world security community of democracies proposes a more ambitious vision involving transformation of NATO and the OECD into true communities of democracy. So can you add to what we're discussing here in terms of how you plan on achieving that ambition, um, how practical it is even uh, given all the challenges that Ash and the others just elaborated on? Yes, uh, thanks Vivian, and greetings to all listeners. Uh, yes, our coalition sees this week's summit as well as the summit for democracy later this year as the first steps in a journey. And we propose a long-term direction for that journey. We envision four milestones. Uh, the first milestone is Ash's vision of a D10, 
and uh, we would like this week's summit to become a permanent forum. We'd like also it to be more inclusive. So maybe one twist on that and just an idea might be a, a more like a D15 with uh, five additional members being chosen or, on a rotating basis, for instance. A second milestone would be for that D10 or D15 to work more closely with the OECD and NATO to develop and implement agreements uh, with a broader group of democracies. And with that, I share Anders' agenda, that that's a very good agenda for starters for democracies to work on. Between them, NATO and the OECD have the expertise or can develop the expertise to foster agreements among broader group on democracies on all these issues. The OECD is already playing that role in a sense. For instance, last week, the G7 finance ministers uh, reached an agreement on a global minimum tax. That, the details of that were hashed out by the OECD. Uh, NATO could do the same on cybersecurity, for instance, or other uh, issues. So both the OECD and NATO are already organizations of democratic nations. Uh, but they are not truly global, and that's the third milestone. We want to globalize them. The OECD has started down that path. It used to be an exclusive club of uh, rich Western countries, but it is slowly opening up to middle-income countries like Colombia and Chile, and we believe that should go on in earnest. NATO, by contrast, seems determined to remain an exclusive club on North Atlantic nation. Uh, it's a bit of a sacred cow, and we believe that's a sacred cow that needs to be killed. Um, Secretary Blinken said uh, that uh, America has European allies and Asian allies, but both don't collaborate with each other, and that's a missed opportunity, and we very much agree with that. Uh, at the end of the day, hard power is at the core of international relations, and the mutual defense pledge of one for all and all for one is the strongest expression of solidarity. And we believe that all democracies should stick together, whether European, Asian, or elsewhere. Uh, so the, the fourth and final milestone is uh, that the OECD and NATO need to reform from the inside. Political cohesion, as Ash has underlined, uh, or, or share sense uh, of uh, identity and, and, and a shared worldview is very important for an alliance. Uh, and it's going to be harder to maintain political cohesion as the membership grows, both in numbers and in diversity. And now I'm talking about the membership of NATO in OECD, but although it applies also to a smaller D10. Um, so in that view, we believe that at some point it would be necessary to, to kill two other sacred cows. Uh, and one is the consensus rule, which we believe will need to be relaxed incrementally um, in order to maintain decisiveness. And the other is the notion that once you're in, you're in forever. Uh, we believe that if you backslide on democracy or if you don't implement the agreements uh, of the OECD and NATO, then there should be a mechanism to kick you out. So this accountability and decisiveness goes together. And that's really the, the challenge, the implementation challenge of this whole plan is to expand over time incrementally so that you can maintain decisiveness and accountability. So pulling it all together, we envisage a global community of democratic nations led by a D10, D15, uh, and with uh, NATO and OECD as executive arms, if you want, that would gather a broader set of democracies. That community would be open to all nations that are committed to democracy, human rights, and international law. Uh, each country would have to decide for themselves whether they are ready to abide by the rule and join. And the very fact, the very option of joining will serve as a powerful incentive to shape up democratic governance, as we have seen in the case of the European Union. Uh, eventually, like the very long-term vision, we hope that all countries will embrace democracy eventually and on their own terms and at their own pace. Uh, but meanwhile, the community should be non-threatening to countries at the outside by strictly respecting international law. 
So that's, uh, in a few words, the, the long-term vision with a, a few milestones uh, to get there. Thank you. Uh, a sacred cow that must be killed. I think that there's definitely going to be a little bit of discussion on that point right there. Uh, thank you so much for that. And so let's uh, open things up. I will throw one question out there from, again, my side of the pond, just to get you all started. Uh, the new guy at the G7 is President Biden, and he's heading over there this week. Uh, what, uh, and please, all of you uh, feel free to jump in. What what are you expecting to hear from him? Obviously, uh, he, he takes a, a very different uh, tone and outlook to multilateralism than his predecessor took. And so, um, you know, is, is, is talk cheap or is, is this a good start? Is that what you want to be hearing before you can get anything done? I, I mean, Lord said, well, if you want to jump in on that one, since you're over there. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think uh, talk is not cheap. Uh, tone really matters in this. And uh, the sense that the G7 leaders, I think as we've already uh, already seen in the run-up to the summit, are determined to reassert the unity of the G7, its common purpose, its common agenda on climate change, on economic resilience, on um, some of the other big uh, issues facing uh, not only us, but the, the wider international community, is critically important. Now, then you've got to follow it up. Of course, you've got to follow it up with the substance, otherwise it is just talk. But the, but the tone is, is important because it creates the political climate in which leaders can frankly go back to their own countries. And uh, Anders knows about this as a former prime minister and say, yeah, I made some compromises, but I made some compromises in, uh, for, the, for the greater good. And I think we saw that with the, uh, the, the groundbreaking tax agreement uh, that was reached between finance ministers just this week. That is not exactly what every country wanted going into that agreement, um, but it, has, it is a really important step forward. And the fact that it's collective and that the fact that the G7 have agreed it and then want to try and secure a wider consensus among other G20 nations is more important than any one country getting their own way on any individual issue. And I think we should see, we'll, the same, we'll see the same on some of the other issues that the G7 is uh, is, is addressing, and that's that's really that's really important. I mean, I could uh, uh, jump in mm -hmm. on that question Please as do. well because I think this is a very important platform for President Biden uh, as his first overseas trip, his, his first opportunity to engage face to face uh, with uh, allies and partners. Um, and I, I think there are a, 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 several goals that he has that and that he'll look to accomplish on this trip. The first, uh, as Lord Sidwell mentioned, is. Essentially, he wants to show that America is back, that, that these alliances matter, that America is ready to lead uh, and, and revive and revitalize its alliances. Uh, he's going to do that at the G7, as well as at NATO uh, and in some bilateral meetings. Um, he also, I think, wants to make sure that he, he communicates that these alliances matter to the American people, to ordinary Americans, so in dealing with issues like COVID recovery and the economic recovery on climate and and things that, are, that people, that ordinary Americans are, uh, care about so that there's a direct connection between sort of what's happening over there and, you know, and foreign policy for the middle class as he, as he likes to call it. Um, and then I think the, the third and really relevant for this discussion is the notion that democracies need to be working more closely together. He, he has a piece in the Washington Post on rallying, uh, the need to rally the democracies, uh, which is the spirit of uh, what what he thinks about in terms of the G7 and NATO and and um, and so I think that idea of a time at a time when we're facing these challenges this inflection point that he's talked about before between autocracy and democracy um, this is a chance for him to be more direct and clear um, about how to how to deal with that challenge uh, over the longer term how, what he what those words lead to in terms of action and outcomes I think remains to be seen. Uh, but but I think that's that's where he's that's the kind of frame that he's looking to accomplish as he heads into these summits. Mm -hmm. uh, President, oh, please, Anders, go ahead. Yeah, just uh, short to follow up uh, on this because I fully agree uh, with both mm -hmm. Ed and, and Mark. Uh, I would hope that President Biden will deliver three messages. Uh, first, he is concerned about the advancing autocracies. Secondly, he sees freedom as the strongest force in the world. And third, uh, that leads him to the conclusion that we need to gather 
all the free societies of the world because uh, united we win and divide, divided we fail. Those are three important messages that I would hope President Biden will deliver. Absolutely. And by the way, uh, the last time we were together, you assured me it's okay to call you Anders, although Ash is making me feel guilty because he keeps calling you prime minister. So I hope we're still okay. Then we say Anders. <laughs> very, good. Good, very good. Very good. Um, so a question for Didier, but also for the rest of you too. Uh, you know, uh, one of the major things that the Biden, the new Biden administration has been stressing is the need for alliances to get anything done, especially on China. It's something that they really stress about is the, the power in numbers. Um, but did you, you know, so is there a value added for D10 when it's hard enough to get allies in the G7 on board on a lot of issues, including China when it comes to tech issues? The Germans have one view, the British have another view. Um, and then now you're talking about expanding this even more broadly. Where is the value added in expanding and, and talking about a D10? And where could that kind of slow things down, slow progress down? Yes, uh, so first of all, for our coalition, uh, we see the community of democracies as a plan B. The, the plan A is a more effective United Nations. Uh, and there are issues where the United Nations should continue to lead and has the capacity to lead, uh, even on, on climate change, the pandemics, all these issues the community of democracies can contribute to, uh, but we, we hope the United Nations can continue to lead. There are also issues that are more contentious and where the United Nations is, is stuck, but where democracies could make more effort to work with China and Russia. Uh, I'm thinking of conflict resolutions, for instance, uh, a conflict like, like Syria, Libya, it's just going to be hard for democracies to, to find a solution on their own. They, they, there's no in escaping the fact that Russia, China have power and if you try to go around them, it makes things more difficult. We don't really see uh, a global NATO, for instance, being the, the global cup. The, the global NATO would focus on defending its members, uh, not necessarily on uh, uh, intervening without UN mandate everywhere. Uh, but uh, on, on economic issues also, that there is a value uh, for the OECD that, that there are a lot of areas uh, like some that uh, Anders were mentioning where, where the UN, we don't expect uh, to, to make a lot of progress. But it does raise a, a question again, if we expand the, the numbers, uh, polit political cohesion becomes a problem. I think we see that already at OECD, where as I mentioned, OECD is open to Colombia and Chile, kind of smaller middle income countries but India, South Africa, Brazil are still observers at the OECD. And that is because they, they don't necessarily accept all the existing OECD rules that were tailored for rich countries. I think that this is the geopolitical challenge of this century is for the Western democracies to really share power with the emerging democracies like India, Brazil, and, and uh, South Africa. Uh, and we, there's really a choice that we, we can hanker down on our privilege and on our exclusive clubs, or we can truly become global, but that does mean sharing power. And I, it's not going to be easy, uh, but that's, I think, what, what we need to do. Are we as strong, a question to all of you now, are we as strong enough as we should be post pandemic? Uh, economic slowdown. You have a backsliding of democracies, it, you know, in, in a lot of traditionally strong Western democracies. Uh, when the U.S. officials met with the Chinese in Alaska in March, the Chinese berated the U.S. for racial tensions, for economic equality, for January 6th that just happened here at the Capitol. How do you then go as a, a, a united front and confront adversaries when there are so many issues at home that so many of these countries are also grappling with? And the, uh, first please, of all, all of I, I, yeah, okay. I, I, first of all, I think we shouldn't be bogged down on the self-doubt in any way because uh, progress in the world has been achieved through openness, and freedom, entrepreneurship, etc. So we have nothing to hide. But I, I think 
that many of us uh, took freedom and democracy for granted, not least after uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of uh, communism. So when the Cold War ended, we got lazy and uh, we became divided. Um, and that's why democracy uh, has been in decline now for the 15th uh, consecutive uh, year and autocrats have been emboldened. So really, I think we have the strength. Together, the world's free societies represent more than 60% of the world economy. That's a formidable force. So if we could really unite, then of course we have a force that will create some respect in Beijing, Moscow and, and uh, elsewhere. But if we continue to be divided because uh, we have issue with them and uh, with the one country then with the other on small issues, then we will lose sight of the bigger picture. And that's why we need an alliance of democracies. And I fully agree with Didier that we should welcome a competition to join the club. <laughs> that's a, mm -hmm. a very strong force. Uh, Lord said, well, you look like you wanted to jump in there. Yeah, by the way, you might, if you're if you're calling um, Anders Anders, you better start calling me Mark, um, because that's, you know, we've just got that the wrong way around otherwise. Anders, um, <laughs> um, uh, so, so just three points. One, I completely agree with the point that Anders just made. Um, you, we do need to remove the self-doubt. Of course, of course, you know, the Chinese can berate the US over the issues you've raised. The key thing about democracies is we're self-correcting. Those issues are in the open. There is a dialectic around them and we address them and improve. The problem with autocracy is they're not self-correcting. Um, and you know, whatever issues there are within their systems, essentially you can, can be suppressed or can, can simply be um, uh, 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 disregarded. And so that self-correction, that, that sort of tension that exists within democracy is one of our strengths. We shouldn't, we shouldn't think that the absence of consensus is a weakness. The, the absence of consensus, the dialectic, the tension is part of what drives us to improve and it drives our free market system as well as our democratic system. Second, I think like Anders and DDA, absolutely right, um, uh, that the, the advanced long-standing democracies in the G7 and others are going to have to uh, be more open to sharing um, uh, power and influence with the emerging democracies. As Anders says, 60% of the world economy um, is uh, uh, is in uh, essentially open societies, uh, and we need to we need to be open and collaborative uh, in doing so, and that's the way we create uh, a more unified approach. It doesn't mean that that is the most effective way of dealing with every issue. Ash's point earlier about you know, enough to be impactful but small enough to be efficient um, uh, is really important, and therefore there will be some variable geometry. The G7 is not just a group of democracies, it's a group of advanced economies that are also democracies. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean you know, we should expand that form. It means that that form should sit alongside other forms like the Alliance of Democracies that um, have a range of economic models, but have um, all adhere to democratic values. And then third point, Didier's other point is really important, that we should be um, open to cooperation with autocracies as well. There are issues on which we must cooperate. The big environmental challenges notably, but also conflict resolution and others as well. That doesn't mean we're compromising our values. We can have detente. We had detente for a long period during the Cold War with the Soviet Union, detente with Chinese characteristics or Russian characteristics or whatever you, whatever you want. There are areas on which we must cooperate and we mustn't allow the idea of this division between a democratic and versus authoritarian system of government to mean that we are condemned to uh, being opposed on every issue. We really shouldn't. There are areas where we do have a common interest and where hopefully um, in the end, uh, we'll see previously authoritarian countries see the benefits um, of uh, the democratic model as we've seen with countries like South Korea um, uh, and others which move from highly authoritarian to Chile, for example, highly authoritarian to democratic regimes and recognize they could continue their economic um, uh, uh, and political progress as they, as they did so. And so that openness is critical um, uh, to this. As Ananda says, you know, people should be competing to be part of that community. 
Go ahead, Ash. If I could uh, add to that, I just want to echo a couple of points that Mark just made because I think it's, it's really critical, which is they're going, there's a need for a number of different types of groupings and different ways of coalescing uh, around coalitions and alliances. At, at the heart of it, we're suggesting that having a D10 that's, that is uh, influential, that consists of the right grouping, uh, can, can actually be an instrument of action, uh, of outcomes and results. And that's why I think it's so important to have the right group in the room and to have the right kind of outlook towards solving and addressing these challenges. But we also completely agree with Didier that we need to have larger coalitions of democracies, uh, as Anders has been suggesting, to put, pull together a larger coalition around shared values. It's just a matter of expectations. Uh, as the group gets larger, uh, what you can hope to accomplish with that group becomes more challenging, but nevertheless has a lot of value because because showcasing the need for solidarity around a common agenda and around common values, even if you can't get there immediately, is, is critically important, especially as we're dealing with autocratic challengers that are looking to divide the world and, and divide the democratic community. Uh, so, so that's critical. And at the same time, as Mark said, we still need to look for places where we can engage with autocratic and other global powers, whether that's at the United Nations or it's at the G20, uh, or other places, there, there, have, there have to be platforms to continue dialogue and engagement uh, on issues where, where maybe there can be some common ground. Um, so, so it's, I think, useful to look at the world, uh, orga organizing the world through these different uh, coalitions, different uh, levels of engagement. Uh, thank you. I have uh, about a hundred other questions I'd love to ask you all, but I want to turn it over to the uh, to the audience. Uh, Titus Alexander, I hope I pronounced that right. Um, he asks, how should a democracy uh, alliance address threats to democracy from within, such as the election of authoritarian rulers in Hungary or of Donald Trump, who undermines trust in democratic institutions and values or distorts or is, uh, distortions by big money and big tech or political parties gerrymandering electoral rules in their own interest? What uh, would you say about that, gentlemen? Uh, just in terms of, uh, you know, how how do you kind of combat some of these bigger forces? I mean, and I'll take the last part of his question, sort of uh, the influences of big money or big tech uh, on politics uh, in all of our countries. Uh, you know, where, where does that stand in this dialogue of democracy um, when you have such powerful forces, you know, in the private sector that can also kind of take a, take a play a role? Um, uh, did you, let Didier go first. Okay. Just um, so I think, first of all, it's really a matter of, of national uh, debate. And I, I do trust that most democracies will really get over this. Uh, I think that the, the threats, the internal threats are, are real. Uh, they can be easily exaggerated, but I, I think uh, most countries really overcome this. In terms of a alliance of democracy, as, as I've mentioned, I think the, the key is, uh, and there's always a tension about who, who do you let in, who do you let, don't let in. Um, I think the solution is to be open, to invite everybody, but to have strict rules. And countries then have to decide for themselves whether they are ready to abide by these rules or not. So there they, they should be some kind of objective criteria. If, if you want to be part of this club, you have to be a democracy, which means A, B, C. And diff different uh, international institutions have already experimented with that. Uh, the European Union, the Council of Europe, I think are, are the best examples, but they are not the only ones. Um, and, and that really then encouraged countries to shape up. I think the, the lesson that we draw from Europe in the case of Hungary and Poland that were mentioned is that once they are in, it's very hard to uh, still keep them uh, on the line, if you if you like. And I, I do think that they should need some more uh, accountability mechanism, including all the way to expulsion, which I think would be very rare, but the very possibility of expulsion will uh, incentivize countries to actually respect democracy. Thanks for that. Um... Hiroaki Nakanishi 
from Facebook asks, uh, is it possible to discuss matters related to the middle class, even with autocratic countries in the framework of a global summit for democracies? Example, enhancing equal treatment for and empowering the middle class. Uh, where does that discussion about empowering the middle class fall in with regard to these G7 and D10 discussions? Um, and how does that strengthen uh, the alliance and confronting um, autocratic forces in the world. Do any of you have any thoughts on that? Well, <laughs> I think it is a cross-cutting issue that will dominate all the discussions, but I don't think that issue should be the key issue to be discussed at the summit for uh, democracy. We do know also from the, the Democracy Perception Index that we published at the Copenhagen Democracy Summit that many people actually consider in economic inequality as uh, one of the obstacles to a true democracy and a threat towards uh, a true democracy. So it is an issue, it's a relevant issue but I don't think we should broaden the, the agenda too much uh, right from, from the beginning. Uh, my take on this uh, would be, like Ash, uh, that we have a small group of powerful, influential uh, democracies as a kind of an executive committee steering this. I also agree with Didier that uh, we, we need a broader we need a much broader alliance or global partnership um, and the organizations he mentioned could absolutely be uh, one of the frameworks uh, for that. But in, in general, I think we should focus on the core elements in a true democracy, regular free and fair elections, uh, rule of law, uh, respect for free speech, uh, religious freedom, etc. The classical uh, characteristics of a true democracy should be the core issues to be discussed at this summit for democracy. If I can uh, build on that, and also link to the previous question, I actually see that the the threats to the middle class and the issue of inequality more generally is one of the drivers, one of the challenges to national democracy. There is a, a growing feeling that nation states are, are losing control uh, because of globalization and, and uh, the internationalization of, of finance in, in particular. Um, and we regard the community of democracy, uh, we, we, we think that democracy should not end at the national border, at the border's edge. Um, and uh, having a, a tighter community of democracies to uh, handle these global globalization issues uh, is also a way then to um, resolve the, this, this tension, the, this sense of loss of control uh, of, of nation states. At the end of the day, uh, global we have a global economy and uh, every citizen sh should have a, a vote in that. And, and, and again, since the national governments cannot do it themselves, we see this, uh, this uh, community of, of democracies as being a, a democratic forum to handle these globalization issues as well. And in the long term, uh, again, democracy doesn't stop at, at the border. It's one person, one vote. That is our ideal for uh, the community of democracies as well. Thank you so much. Uh, Carl Friedrich Kaler asks, do you see a military confrontation with either Russia or China within the next decade or two to stop threat the threats um, posed on their neighbors in Europe and the Far East? Anyone even either, wanna I guess go either there? the former Secretary General of NATO or the former National Security Advisor should go first on this one. Um, I don't think it's likely. Um, at least a at least a strategic level confrontation. I think uh, frictions where we may have forces or proxy forces um, in conflict with each other are quite likely. Um, there may well be incidents, but I don't think a major confrontation is likely, and it certainly isn't um, uh, desirable. Um, but I think 
there is another issue that we really need to watch here. And it's some, it goes by a variety of names, maneuver in the gray zone, um, et cetera. But essentially this is um, a, a conflict or confrontation that operates below the level of armed conflict, a formal armed conflict. And that is ongoing. Uh, whether it's uh, cyber attacks, uh, some of the information warfare, this which of course relates to the earlier questions about the integrity of the democratic process, um, given the uh, the way that social media sometimes associated with um, you know, informal groups in places like Russia um, uh, try to get involved in uh, Western elections uh, and so on. And so we do need to recognise we're in a more complex world where um, there is a, there's an ongoing contest between um, the democratic nations and the autocratic ones. And that doesn't have to break into armed conflict for it still to be uh, a, serious, uh, a serious challenge for us. And we need to equip ourselves to be able to deal with that gray zone conflict as it's sometimes called as well. It also means, by the way, we need to think of national security in a broader way. So we've traditionally, if national security 1.0 was the defense of the realm, the NATO, uh, the classic NATO remit, if you like, 2.0 was um, dealing with counterterrorism and other issues of that kind. 3.0 adds to that economic security, human security, and indeed democratic security, because we have to be conscious that our democratic systems are under uh, some kind of external threat as well, and they need to be properly uh, protected. Uh, and so uh, that means that the challenge for the people doing those jobs now is ever more complex than it was before. They need to, they need to deploy a much wider range of tools to protect um, our democratic um, systems as well as our economies and our, our national security. Um, I fully agree uh, with Mark's uh, analysis. I don't think an armed conflict is likely, and certainly I don't hope such a conflict uh, will break out. However, it's very much dependent on our will to defend ourselves. There is an old saying that if you want peace, be prepared for war. And I think it's of crucial importance to send the right message to China and to Russia that we will do what it takes to defend ourselves and the principles upon which we have built our societies. That's the best way to avoid a conflict. Take Taiwan as an example. I am sure it is a Chinese ambition to, one way or the other, take over Taiwan at a certain point down the road. The best way to protect Taiwan and avoid an armed conflict would be to issue, uh, to issue a kind of, maybe not a security guarantee, but something that clearly announces our support for a democratic Taiwan. I think faced with that, the, gov the communist government in Beijing would hesitate to uh, initiate an armed conflict uh, to take over uh, Taiwan. So the world needs not only global policemen to restore international law and order, but also a global fireman to extinguish all uh, the fires that have broken out because of the lack of American leadership during recent years. Thank you. I think probably uh, a no to imminent war is a good place to probably leave this discussion. Sadly, we are out of time, but um, we really appreciate everyone's questions out there. And of course, thanks to our brilliant speakers. Uh, we are all going to uh, be much more well informed going into the next couple of days with these interesting summits ahead. Um, thanks to all of our viewers and our participants in the debate. Uh, the last word has definitely not been said about uh, building an alliance for democracies, and we wish uh, uh, best of luck to the UK government and its G7 leaders uh, this week, obviously, as they try to work toward that goal. Um, and thanks so much to Anders and the Alliance for Democracies Foundation for having me back again. Uh, you've been watching the hashtag Defend Democracy event for the Alliance of, Glo of Democracies Foundation in partnership with the Coalition for a World Security Community of Democratic Nations. Thanks so much to everyone and have a great day.